Okay, can. Okay, thanks Eugene for your time today. Uh, so anyway, the purpose of um, this series of talks is to experiment with the idea of uh, learning through asking questions and to find areas uh, of, of focus pertaining to practical challenges that residents and internists face uh, in their day-to-day -day practice. So through this, we hope to that as a community, we will be able to push the comfort zones of our practice in areas outside our specialty and be able to manage patients uh, better holistically. So today we'll be talking about uh, atrial fibrillation with uh, Dr. Eugene, who is a cardiologist uh, with, an, with an area of interest in electrophysiology. So um, maybe we could start off by um, exploring why AF is something significant and why it's something that we have to treat seriously. So anyway, I guess the reason for this question is a lot of AF is not incidentally, right? So like, why is it something significant? Yeah. Yeah, so so actually AF is very common in our population. Um, it's actually the most common uh, supraventricular arrhythmia, if you put it that way. Um, and also it has very important clinical implications because it has an increased risk of stroke, um, dementia, mortality, and stuff like that. So with with the increased um, aging population that we are seeing, AF is getting more and more common. And we see it every day in every sort of specialty that you that you work in. Mm. Okay. Uh, so I guess that would be a good lead-in to, to the next case scenario that we see uh, in a slightly, in a very familiar context that we, that we see in our day-to-day -day practice. So this is a fairly middle-aged elderly gentleman, 65 years old, with hypertension and DM. And he presents with uh, what sounds like a picture of cellulitis and was noted to be slightly tachycardic in the A&E. And ECG was performed and he was found to be in atrial fibrillation and something that we see quite commonly. So before we break it down into the specific components of our management, um, what are the general principles that um, you would get in terms of approaching this patient, Dr. Eugene? Okay, so I think the, the first uh, most important thing is uh, the, to make sure what you are seeing on the ECG is truly AF. Lah, okay? Because sometimes you might see different rhythms that look uh, irregular, uh, but you can actually see P waves interspersed between them. So that might not be AF. Okay. So after you are sure that this is AF, then the other thing to look at is what precipitated the AF, whether there's an underlying cause or uh, a trigger that, that, you know, that made the AF come on. Uh. Then the next thing to do is to look at, obviously, the hemodynamics of the patient. Yep. Right? So if he's tachycardic and he's hypotensive, as compared to as, uh, his tachycardic but normal tensive, then your treatment is obviously quite different. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, treat, treating the acute causes of the, or the acute triggers will be the next thing to do uh, before you institute more specialized AF therapies. Uh. Okay. So I would, mm -hmm. say I'll, I'll say that the main thing is number one, confirm diagnosis of AF. Number two, identify the triggers. And number three, look at the hemodynamics. These are the first things that you should be thinking of when you first approach the patient in ED or in a ward whenever you have such a case. Okay, thanks. So you mentioned about uh, the first important thing is to confirm AF and you mentioned that um, oftentimes, sometimes the irregular rhythm, but you pick up P waves. Do you have any tips in terms of identifying P waves? Because it's something that I, I see that people may struggle with. They don't know where to look for P waves, how you characterize a P wave. Is it just like artifact versus a P wave? So do you have any advice for that? <clears throat> okay, so, so the best leads to look at uh, for P waves are V1 or lead 2. Okay, so those are the, the leads that I usually go to to look for P waves. Uh, but that said, you should also look at the whole ECG to look at every other lead to make sure that you know you don't see something that that might be suggestive of a P wave. Uh, okay, uh, that's one. Number two, P wave amplitude is usually much smaller than QRS complex, um, and it should precede the PR, uh, precede the QRS complex. So if you see something that sharp, pointy, that doesn't look like a QRS, then that's something that you might want to consider uh, in, in terms of uh, PQRS relationship. Uh, okay? The most common thing that some people will um, misdiagnose AF for is in the presence of sinus rhythm or sinus tachycardia. So the rhythm is quite, the heart rate is quite fast mm. and you have PACs coming in. Yeah. So sometimes the P wave might be buried in a T wave, which makes it quite difficult to see. And, and then some people might just diagnose this as AF. But if you can see the presence of sinus P waves 
uh, going on with the sinus tachycardia, then you know that it tells you that he's unlikely to be to be AF, like, even though the rhythm is irregular. Okay. okay so, so the main thing that I would say is looking at V1 and lead two, looking for the sinus P waves that should be very clear, and then we have these extra beats. I look for the P waves that may be buried in the T waves to tell you that this might be ectopic instead of atrial fibrillation. Okay, got it. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that the other thing that we uh, struggle with also is like when we identify patients with AF, then sometimes we don't know what constitutes the full set of the workup. Does every patient need a thyroid screen or electrolytes check, or does every patient need an echo? Hmm. So, so this will be the next question uh, that you uh, that we have on the slide. Yeah. So the standard workup uh, would be to look for the electrolytes number one because you know with uh, electrolyte imbalances you can definitely trigger AF. Uh, that's I mean we all know that. Uh, number two, uh, thyroid function is very important as well because uh, in, in patients who, not in this case with, with, uh, with infection, but in some other cases when you have a patient who comes in purely for atrial fit and you don't really know what's the cause, uh, a thyroid test will be quite useful because high, high thyroid level can, can actually precipitate AF. Mm -hmm. The third thing that uh, what some of us will do is um, to do an echo. Okay? So the, the main reason for doing an echo is to look for structural causes. Um, and also to look for, basically there are a couple of things that we look at, uh, whether any structural lesions, whether there is, uh, what the EF is like. So if the heart function is quite poor, I mean, we kind of expect EF to be um, a natural, you know, sequelae of, of the poor EF. And also whether there are any valvular lesions such as MS, MR, that kind of thing. So, so the echo will give us a rough idea of what's happening in the heart that can be driving the AFIT. Okay, but in terms of uh, lab work wise, the usual stuff would be the electrolytes, the thyroid function, your infective markers mm -hmm. uh, as a basic screen for, for ACM. Do you normally do a TROP? Is there a value in doing a TROP in, like, let's say, this current patient who's slightly tachycardic at 110, 120, for example? Yeah. So, in, in, this, in this scenario, the troponin that you do would most likely be elevated, mm. but it may or may not be due to the AS. Yep. Okay, so in a patient with uh, IHD, for instance, uh, with, with infections, you can always cause type 2 MIs yep. or basically myocardial injury la, okay, from increased demand. So what you do is uh, when you send a top eye, what it reflects is some myocardial damage or myocardial injury, uh, which may or may not be due to MI, which may or may not be due to the AF. So it's a bit hard to tell in that sort of situation. Um, but I think the troponin does help in risk stratification in terms of a clinical scenario. We have AF, you have a very rich elevated uh, troponin level, for instance, more than a thousand, more than two thousand. Then you know it suggests something else that's going on. Okay. Yeah. So if it's like mildly elevated, it may be difficult to interpret. But if it's very very deranged, then you may want to evaluate for like ischemic heart disease and all that. Yes, that's right. Okay, sure. Yeah. Um, just as a seg segue to this, um, how how hard do you evaluate for CAD IHD in patients with uh, AF, do you use your ECHO as the um, first screening tool to see whether there's RWMAs to guide how far you go or what, what are your principles for that? Okay, so, so the first thing um, I would do is basically go back to the history taking. Okay, mm -hmm. So, I mean, this patient came with an acute issue, but we also don't know what his baseline is like at home. So if he has exertional symptoms even before coming in or before he has all this injective stuff going on, then it suggests that uh, there is actually uh, th there might be some CAD going on. Okay, that's one. Number two, uh, when you when you have an ECG with AF, you can also have some ischemic changes. So very widespread ST changes or T wave inversions can also give you a clue as to underlying AHD. Okay. The third thing would be the echo. So the RWMA, the ES, all can give you an idea as well. So I would say that it's a global thing. Right? So you look at everything, your history, your uh, echo findings, the ECG findings, and as well as your troponin findings to, to kind of tell you how, how I mean, to, to give you an idea of how high likelihood this patient is uh, likely to have uh, IHD. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay, so the next question uh, is with regard to rate and rhythm control. So, I mean, in medical school, we're always taught AF, you can do uh, rate, rhythm control, and your AFIRM trial in 2002 suggests that both are okay. La. I mean, that's briefly what I took away from my teachings. But I guess um, oftentimes what we see out of the cardiology context is um, most people will just rate control regardless because it's what we are familiar with. 
Um, so maybe you could just give us an idea as to actually, um, yeah, how do we decide between the two? Who actually gets rhythm control so, since we don't really see much of it? Okay. So the rhythm control group are uh, usually patients who have proximal AF and who are very symptomatic. Okay. okay so a, a, any bit of AF that comes on, they feel very you know, uncomfortable, a lot of palpitations. And that's, a, that's the group that we tend to go with uh, anti arrhythmics to try to control the, the rhythm. Uh, in the subset of population that we see in hospital, more commonly are the older patients um, who have either heart failure or they have some sort of infection, post op AS, you know, many, many other triggers. Uh, usually in that kind of situation, what we will try to do is uh, to, to optimize the rate control and to treat the underlying cause or to treat the, the underlying precipitants or triggers. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the problem with anti arrhythmics is that it has a lot of side effects as well. So your patient selection must be uh, correct like, in that sense for, for rhythm control. Okay? Okay. And also I think the trust also in the past showed that there's not much difference. So you know, the, 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 the general principle is treat the annulling cause and, and um, unless you're very symptomatic, then usually it's rate control. Okay. So what's your classic um, archetype of patient who actually ends up getting rhythm control? Is it like your, I don't know, like young patients with uh, high right disease or th those end up getting treated and may not need it, is it? So like what kind of patients normally end up getting rhythm control that you, based on your experience? Yeah, so the ones who tend to get rhythm control are those with uh, proximal AF okay. who get very symptomatic when the AF comes on and then they are fine after that. Okay, uh, so that's the typical group, and they are mostly patients who who are quite well, don't really have that much clinical history, okay. uh, not that many comorbidities, uh, because the ones with the comorbidities usually have persistent AF. Mm -hmm. So the other thing that we look at also is, you know, how how much the heart has remodeled. Yeah. So if your atrial is very big, um, you can try to get rid of the AF by shocking him, like mm -hmm. cardioversion and all that. But at some point, it will probably come back. Okay. So. So there are a couple of things that we consider in terms of rate and rhythm. And if we think that the AF is most likely going to come back, then you might go with our rate, rate control strategy. Okay. okay. If so we choose a, sorry, if we choose a rate control strategy, usually I think we, we generally tend to start with beta blockers. Yeah, is there a particular yeah. rate that we aim for? Or? Okay, so, so in, uh, in most patients, you need to look at uh, which state they are in. So in the acutely unwell patients in hospital, so those who just come in through ED for an infection or for whatever reason, uh, where you can identify a, a trigger, uh, the heart rate that I usually go for is about maybe 100 to 110 or 120. Okay, And the reason for that is because they are tachycardic for a reason. Uh, if, they have, if they have an infection, um, they are, they're expected to be tachycardic. Right? It's part of the body's response. So sometimes what the, what the body does is the heart rate goes up to try to compensate for whatever infection they have, right? So by actively blocking the rate too much, you might actually cause more decompensation instead. So I would say that, you know, a rate of 100 to 120 is acceptable. But if you go on to like 140, 150, 160, then that might be too fast. Um, especially in the cardiac patients, it might trigger heart failure. So uh, from that point of view, then I would try to bring it down. Okay. Uh, if it's a patient in an outpatient setting, meaning they are well, they are still in the clinic, and they have a history of AF or they are in persistent AF, what you want to do is to try to optimize their heart rate to less than 70 beats per minute. So less than 70 would be an ideal target. Lah. Okay. So uh, there are some trials on that, but basically 70 for well patients, 110 for those who are a bit unwell. So these are the main targets that we go for. In terms of the agents that we use, you're right, the first one that we usually use is a beta blocker because um, AF can be a, a result of increased sympathetic drive. So you, by blocking them, you block your sympathetic drive and you block your AV node as well. So you reduce the, um, the heart rate, that, I mean the ventricular rate. Okay. The other drugs that you can use are either calcium channel blockers, like verapamil, dutiazone, or digoxin. But they're a bit different. Huh? So, so verapamil and detoxin, you ideally want to know their EF first before giving patients these drugs because they should be avoided in patients with poor cardiac function. Huh? So okay. if the EF is less than 40%, I would say I would try to avoid that because it can cause more problems. Okay. Uh, the other thing is that uh, for digoxin, it's usually quite a safe drug 
except in patients with renal failure. So you want to avoid overdosing patients with renal impairment with high doses of digoxin. Uh, in patients in in patients with uh, beta blockers already, what sometimes we do is we add on digoxin to try to um, uh, we add both in to optimize their weight control. So an example would be maybe bisoprolol and digoxin concurrently to try to optimize your weight control. So that might help. They are kind of synergistic in a way because digoxin acts on AV node and the vagal tone. Yeah, so so they, they they work in different ways. Some people do give um, beta blockers and calcium channel blockers, but if you do that, you have to be very careful because they can precipitate quite severe bradycardia. So that's something that you want to be careful. Um, these are the main things that we give for rate control at the moment. The the other one that we can give in very unwell patients. So you might see patients in high D or ICU who who might not be able to talk, especially the post-surgical patients, the, the GI patients, if they can't swallow tablets, right, uh, MVM. So sometimes what we might have to do is, other than IV digoxin, we might end up giving IV immodorone um, as a form of weight control. Uh, so uh, in those very acutely unwell patients, like uh, so post-op patients who cannot, who are new by mouth, or in uh, patients with heart failure who are on CPAP, incubated, cannot be on beta blockers, you might consider some immo for weight control. Okay, uh, but that's usually the, the the second line or third line. We don't give it up front. Yeah. Okay, so maybe moving on to the practicals of how you actually start, right? So I guess you mentioned there are different mm. different contexts. There is like, I guess your on call scenario where let's say patient a bit tachycardic, hundred ten, hundred twenty CTSP, um, and then maybe that's the kind that you are start are seeing the patient first time in clinic. So generally, like, what agents do you choose? To start with, um, in terms of let's say beta blockers, given that it's what's with, what we commonly use, and what doses do you normally start with, and how do you up titrate them? Okay, so on call, what I usually do is to give a short acting beta blocker. Uh, the main reason being uh, you don't want the effects to last for too long, that might then cause problems later on that you can't correct. Mm. Okay? So, some of the things that uh, we can give include metoprolol and carbidolol. Okay, the difference between metoprolol and carbidolol is that. Carbidolol has a bit more effects on the blood pressure. It can drop blood pressure a bit more. Metoprolol is more beta selective. Okay. Okay. Um, I tend to go by a smaller dose of 12.5 metoprolol or 25 uh, mm-hmm. for patients who, who need rate control in the ward on call at night. Um, and then it will assess the response and see how, how the patient responds to, to the metoprolol or the carbi. Carbi, the smaller dose, smallest is 3.125. So you can give 3.125 or 6.25. Uh, but I tend to just give metoprolol to avoid the effects on blood pressure. So how long later okay. should you assess and consider giving another dose? So about one to two hours, you can have a look at the patient again okay. and, and see, see whether the patient is responding. So some patients who, who are very tachycardic and not really responsive, huh, uh, then you might want to think about what, what is driving the rate to be so high because there must be something going on that you're not treating mm. that's causing the rate to be so high. So in, in uh, surgical patients, you might want to think about bleeding, think about uh, pain, something else that's going on or something's not right, or some infe- post-op infection. Okay? In the medical patients, then you know, think about why they first came in, what's the underlying cause, is there some form of sepsis that's going on now, something different, or is the patient decompensating from a cardiac point of view for, the, for those in the cardiac ward? So these are the things that you have to consider. So other than treating the number, you have to also treat the underlying reason why the heart rate is so high. Okay. So then, so, yep. another challenge that we have with the beta blockers is that sometimes when patients come in, the BP is already quite borderline. Maybe not low to the extent that you will consider uh, um, shocking the patient, but, but yep. maybe the systolic in the hundreds and the nineties and you're worried about giving metoprolol, then what, what should we do in that kind of scenario? So, so usually in this kind of situations, I'll give digoxin. Okay, so digoxin doesn't have uh, that much an effect on blood pressure. So, uh, usually we can give, if let's say the rate is really fast and the blood pressure is a bit borderline, we can give a bit of IV digoxin. So usually 125 or 250. Um, but just be careful of the, the renally impaired patients, although usually a dose is fine. Okay. The other alternative is uh, immodorone. But again, immodorone in some patients can drop blood pressure. So just have to be a bit more careful when you give the immodorone. But uh, in patients with borderline BP, I think digoxin should be a reasonable option. What about max alpha? I mean, some people like to give magnesium sulfate. Is there evidence? Yeah, so it's, it's one of the drugs that we give in MICU, right? Um, 
but I think the evidence is is not really uh, um, there's no no clear evidence that it helps okay. okay, so I would say that if anything, magnesium sulfate does it does help correct some of the the hypomagnesemia. Mm. Uh, it does help with membrane stability. As to why it works sometimes and why it doesn't, I, I don't really know. But it's, I mean, it it does help in some cases. So if if you really have run out of options, you can try. Yeah. Okay. Um, so talking about magnesium, this is often what we see. Um, is there evidence to this and what's the basis for this? I mean, we aim for sort of like super therapeutic levels of yeah. magnesium, right? Yeah, so I, I would say that this is uh, a general principle in terms of you know, making sure electrolytes are well optimized. Mm. Um, as to these specific levels, I would think that it applies more to digoxin. Okay. Because you, you want to avoid hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia in patients who are on digoxin because you can you can precipitate ditch toxicity. Okay. But on the whole, I would say that you know you, you do have to optimize electrolytes. So I think as a general principle, this level is is a, it's a I mean it's an acceptable level for all patients with atrial fitness. You should try to ideally maintain it if possible. Okay. Can. So now maybe we shift gears a bit and we talk a bit about anticoagulation. Uh, so maybe we can start with um, who should be anticoagulated. And um, I mean, we learn practically that anticoagulation at the end of the day is about balancing your coughing risk and your bleeding risk. And in medical school, we learn things like your Chatswa score as well as things like your HESLAT score, let's say, for bleeding risk. So uh, number one, who should be anticoagulated? And number two, how do you reconcile such things in practice? Okay, so usually... Uh, in terms of anticoagulation, we still go by chest vest score now. Uh, there are a couple of situations where we anticoagulate regardless of chest vest score. Okay, so this will be patients with other reasons or other indications for anticoagulation, like perhaps LV thrombus, or you know, have DBT or PE before. Okay, uh, the other one is in patients with HOCA, so you also want to just anticoagulate this patient. Uh, but for all other patients, we tend to go by chest vest score for um, patients with non-valvular AF. Okay, so anything above, greater or above, uh, greater or equal to two, you should anticoagulate this group of patients. So in the past, we used to say that chest vest one, uh, a bit borderline, you can either give aspirin or anticoagulation. But I think we have kind of moved from that practice to just anticoagulation or nothing. So all or none kind of principle. So either you anticoagulate or you don't anticoagulate. Chest vest zero, I think we can be quite assured that uh, their risk is low. So we don't really need to anticoagulate those group of patients. Okay, so I would say that uh, in terms of who to anticoagulate, definitely um, all patients with the indications for anticoagulation should go ahead. For patients with non-valvular AF, we should uh, go by chest vest score. In terms of the bleeding risk, uh, uh, we also go by the blood score. Okay, most patients are technically usually okay in terms of bleeding, um, but they are. Uh, there's this group of patients, subset of patients who tend to have a bit higher bleeding risk. Lah. So, s score has a lot of other parameters inside. You can just calculate and you can see. And ideally, you want the, the benefit of anticoagulation to outweigh the bleeding risk. Mm. Right? So, basically, the, the benefit of anticoagulation is stroke prevention. Right? So, if you, you want to basically see how much your, your risk of stroke is compared to uh, your, your risk of bleeding is. And, and if, let's say, the risk of stroke it's much higher than the risk of bleeding, then obviously we you know, want to reduce that risk by anticoagulating. So I would say that then the, your, your, the lead on to the next question is when, to, when do we not anticoagulate for patients with a high bleeding risk, right? what should we do? So in this subset of patients who, who really have a very high risk of stroke from AF, uh, but also at high bleeding risk, so perhaps those who have bled before, those who have a GI ulcer and, and etc. Uh, one of the ways uh, one of the considerations that, that we do is uh, to put a watchman device. So that's a LA appendage closure device. Mm. Okay. So um, by doing that, you kind of block off the LA appendage where clots usually form. So uh, you can then subsequently take the patient off anticoagulation uh, in the long term. Okay. Uh, mm. so, so that's one of the considerations for patients with very high bleeding risk but need to be anticoagulated. Mm. Yeah. So the LA appendage closure is a uh, or the watchman device is one of the options that are available. Okay. For chest vas, do we differentiate between male and females in terms of the levels of cutoff? Yeah, so so females are, are usually at higher risk. Mm. Okay. Um, and 
if you have a female without any other risk factors, meaning your chest vest is one purely because the patient is female, mm. then your risk is actually quite low. It's almost like zero. Okay. okay. But if you have a, a female with another risk factor, then her risk is higher. Then that, that is the kind of situation where you want to anticoagulate. So if you look at the latest ACC AF guidelines, uh, female being female alone does not increase your risk tremendously. So yeah. in that, that group of patients might not need to be anticoagulated. Okay. I guess the other question also is about specifically regarding um, the timing of when we initiate anticoagulation. For, 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 like, for example, the case scenario where there was just one episode of AF that may have been triggered by the sepsis, is that significant enough to warrant anticoagulation or should we confirm this with a holder to see how much the AF is before we start anticoagulation? Yeah. So, so again, I would say that it depends on the patient's thromboembolic risk. So check their score. Okay, if it's very high, five or six, you, you, you expect this patient to have AF at some point, or you know, uh, he might already have AF without you knowing. Miss proxy some more AF, not picked up along the way, and just that he happens to be in hospital and you pick it up. Mm. Okay, so in those with very high chest stress score, I would, I would push towards anticoagulation. Uh, in, in patients with a one off thing, so like maybe just hypertension and then sepsis and now have AF. Uh, I think there's, there, there are no clear guidelines on this. La, okay? But different people do different things. So some people just go ahead and keep going with it, again, based on chest space. Uh, some people will repeat a whole outpatient in a, in a few months' time when the patient is well and see if the AF comes back and then decide to anticoagulate at that point. Uh, the only problem with that is that if it's truly proximal, it might not pick it up during your holter. So you won't know. So, so I would say the best uh, gauge is to, still to go by your chest vest score. Yeah. I would say that the risk of that of the AF coming back is probably higher in cardiac patients. Those with poor EF, um, enlarged atrium, valvular lesion, those are the higher risk patients. Okay. Um, okay, so next, uh, warfarin versus uh, Joex. Um, what's the latest hmm. evidence and um, yeah, how do you decide? Okay, so I think warfarin has been around for the longest time. So uh, it has been the standard of drug for a long time. But over the last maybe five, 10 years, I think the wax have been coming a bit more uh, into the market and we are prescribing a bit more now. And in fact, the latest guidelines actually uh, recommend using the wax if possible ahead of warfarin. Okay, uh, so there are three in NUH, four in the market, but three, only three available in Singapore. Uh, Epixaban, um, Rivaroxaban and the bigger trend. The Edoxaban, I don't think it's, it's so definitely not in NUH. I'm not sure if the other hospitals carry it, but definitely not here. Uh, so within the three, uh, compared to warfarin, um, similar billing risk but lower ICH risk la, for the DOEX. Okay, and what we tend to tell patients is that even though warfarin is cheap, warfarin is about seventeen cents today, one seven. Uh, a DOEX is about three dollars a day, so there's quite a bit of a price difference. But if you compare the time that you travel to and fro the hospital for INR, the clinic visits and all that, then the cost would kind of average out to be about the same. Okay, so up front, we will try to recommend a DOEX. Um, Apixaban has um, actually mortality benefit in the trials that they, they did, um, but we also have Rivaroxaban that's available in the bigger trend. Okay, uh, in terms of uh, uh, how many patients actually do take up warfarin or DOEX, uh, I would say that price consideration is still a big thing. Uh. So even though you tell patients that DOEX is going to be roughly the same as warfarin, patients are still uh, actually quite keen uh, to for, for the older patients, uh, they're still quite keen to stick on stick to other warfarin, continue taking the warfarin or you know upfront just take warfarin. Yeah, that's the main that's the main thing. But the wax definitely the first choice now. The other thing I want to tell is also uh, in patients with renal impairment because all these DOEX actually uh, have a a cap in terms of the the EGFR or the creatinine clearance. So in those with very severe renal impairment, you might want to avoid them. Although a pixelban is kind of a two B indication for patients with severe renal failure or dialysis. Okay. So between choosing them, um, so like you mentioned, we know uh, impairment is a consideration. Are there any other considerations in this mm. between your different types of DOEX? Uh, so, uh, uh, so the other one is, uh, we, we tend to prescribe a bit more of rivaroxaban, apixaban. Uh, rivaroxaban is once a day, apixaban is twice a day. Um, apixaban has, has mortality benefit. So, so a lot of, you know, uh, Definitely one of the better options, but some elderly patients might not be that compliant with twice a day medi twice a day medications. Uh, 
So if that is a consideration, then you might want to try with Roxabine. Because just once a day, just take it in the morning and then with the other medications and you're done. So that's the other consideration. But in general, I think that the two, uh, Epixaban and Rivaroxaban is about the same. Okay. Yeah. And um, in terms of reversal, do we actually hold the reversal agents in uh, our institution and when should we consider using them? Okay, so uh, for the bigger trend, I, I haven't used it myself, but I, I know that it's available in any age. The only thing that is, if you want to use it, you, you'll have to call hematology okay. to, to use it. So, I mean, send out a blue letter and then they'll kind of see and then they'll uh, institute that for you. Uh, there's a reversal with the factor 10A ones, but I'm not sure if they're available here. Okay. Yeah. So, but, def but definitely, if you need reversal, you need to call hematology for, for, for the bigger trend. Okay. I'm not wrong, in valvular AF also, perhaps uh, uh, the DOEX are not so uh, suitable. Uh, I, I wonder what, what, what fully constitutes patients in valvular AF. Yeah, so valvular AF would be uh, rheumatic microstenosis or patients with uh, valve replacement. So as long as you have a mitral valve replacement, uh, uh, DOEX, only warfarin. Yeah, so I think they kind of expanded the, the definition a little bit into, into repair and all that. But in general, I would say that if you have rheumatic mitral stenosis or if you have valve intervention before, try to use warfarin if possible. Yeah. Okay. Um. So maybe the next group would be the patients with uh, AF and IHD, specifically in the context if, let's say, they had an ACF, they had a stent put in. Um, so there's single therapy, dual therapy, triple therapy. How do we make sense of all this? Hmm. So the patients who had, who had a stent put in for ACS would uh, usually need about a month of triple therapy. In the past, it used to be warfarin, plavix, aspirin. And then after a month, we cut to warfarin and plavix, and then lifelong warfarin. Uh, the, for the newer ones, it, it's kind of the same uh, kind of same regimen. So the DOEX plus DAPT for a month, and then DOEX plus plavix, and then DOEX after that. So I would say that the, in terms of the regimen, it's about the same. Uh, you just need to cut the, uh, the, the triple therapy at the end of one month because the risk of bleeding is very high with triple, triple therapy. Yeah, and usually the DAPT that we give together with anticoagulation would be aspirin and plavix. Because if you give ticagrelor or prosugrelor, the, the risk of bleeding is quite high. So we want to avoid that. Okay. What if it's unstented, like just an ACS, an NSTEMI kind? Because um, normally we DAPT for one year in a normal context. How yeah. So I'll, I'll follow the same, same regimen if it's uh, ACS. Because uh, regardless, all ACS should be on DAPT for a year. I mean, uh, so, so we want to still keep with that and, and um, if possible, you should follow the regimen. But understand that in some patients, the bleeding risk might be too high. So you might want to reduce the, the duration of, of uh, a duet and plavix uh, to a little bit shorter. So I think, but it's all quite individualized. It really depends on how high the bleeding risk is. Okay, sure. Uh, Ken. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so there. Okay. Aspirin. Um, I mean, so sometimes when the bleeding risk is high, some some people will say, okay, let's go for it in between ground and uh, consider giving aspirin. So, what's uh, your take on that? So I would say that aspirin. We we try to phase out using aspirin for AF now. If the bleeding risk is really high, then uh, like what is uh, we said before, uh, we will offer a watchman device um, or LA. A closure device to to try to you know, counter the bleeding risk. Otherwise, um, aspirin is not really recommended nowadays anymore. Okay, even in like let's say elderly patients who may not necessarily be fit for like a procedural kind of intervention, do we in those instances um how do you navigate this problem? Uh, so in in those in those cases, uh, I think you need to just be upfront with the family. <laughs> Uh, and tell them that, you know, there's the risk of stroke, which is pretty high. Um, depends. So you calculate yourself, uh, this check risk score, okay? Um, and there's also the bleeding risk. So on the one hand, you might want to um, reduce the risk of stroke, cause more debilitation, cause her to be, I mean, him or her to be uh, more physically impaired. Uh, but there's the risk of bleeding, which can be fatal in, in severe cases. 
um, as compared to uh, not treating it. Uh. So uh, basically you treat and she bleeds or you don't treat and she comes and gets a stroke. So it's kind of a balance between the two. Okay. And then you need to see what the family wants. Mm -hmm. If the family, um, so most families at this, so I'll assume that this group of patients are usually the very elderly kind. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, if you discuss with the family, you present to them the different risks, uh, most of them would just not uh, start anticoagulation and just need it. Um, bear in mind also that aspirin has a risk of bleeding as well. So uh, I wouldn't say that the risk of aspirin or the risk of bleeding from aspirin is much lower than anticoagulation. So she's all pretty high. Okay. Uh, so the only thing is that the effect on stroke prevention is not so great. So, you know, by starting aspirin, I'm not sure if you're doing, really doing them a service. Got it. Um, okay, so maybe we can, uh, we've talked quite a bit. Um, so which patients do you think um, will really benefit from a cardiology referral? Because I guess some of the things, like let's say initiating um, beta blockage therapy, uh, commencing on anticoagulation, um, oftentimes these are some of the things that we can also do. So which patients um, would definitely uh, require a referral, both maybe inpatient versus uh, outpatient, and what are good, uh, let's say for outpatient referral, what would be a good PCU? Uh, timing um, that you would appreciate. Okay, so I think the problem with this is that um, in patients, so we talk about inpatients first. Huh? Mm. Um, most of the time, you would, the, the team that refers or the medical team that refers will have done some form of workup. Mm. Uh, might be in terms of the blood test or the echo. Okay, so uh, these patients would ideally all should be anticoagulated if the chest stress is high, number one. Mm. Uh, this can be done by either the medical team or by us. Uh, okay? mm. But I will say that the ones who really need to be seen by us are those with um, poor cardiac function, so the EF is very bad. Okay? Or number two, if there's a structural lesion, so meaning um, patient might have rheumatic MS or patient has hokum or something else, uh, like, a, you know, like a ASD, VSD or something. Okay? Uh, the third thing that you need to be very careful of, which um, would be on the ECG would be a presence of a delta wave. Okay, okay? so mm -hmm. patients who have um, pre-excitation on the on the ECG and together with AF are actually at very high risk mm -hmm. of sudden death. Yeah. Okay, because the AF is uh, down the accessory pathway can cause a VF. So so these are the patients who need a uh, urgent referral because we want to number one stop uh, uh, that from I mean, prevent CD from happening. And number two, what we usually do is we schedule an uh, early ablation procedure for the patient to, to try to minimize the risk. Uh, in terms of uh, PCU-wise, so it really depends. I feel that, uh, so there are again different, different uh, management practices la, among different people. Huh? Uh, I would say that as long as yes, you have started anticoagulation, mm -hmm. uh, patient should be seen in a month's time uh, basically, to check for bleeding, check the full blood count, and and make sure that you know he doesn't have any bleeding. Uh. This can be seen by anyone. Can be seen by the medical team. Can be seen by us. Doesn't matter. Okay. Um, but if the patient is not started on anticoagulation, then we should ideally see the patient early as well because if you give a appointment in six months, you don't know what's going to happen in the six months. Yeah. So I would say that to be on the safer side, usually we'll see a bit earlier. Uh, so that we can institute some form of uh, anticoagulation. Uh, those who already started, can see us in six months, no issue, three months, no issue. But you just need to make sure that she doesn't have any bleeding in one month's time. Okay. Uh, for the outpatient uh, uh, setting, so patients in clinic, let's say in, in medicine clinic that uh, you want us to see, I think same applies if, you, if you've already um, started him with anticoagulation, then just need to follow up in one month, make sure no bleeding, they can see us anytime. Uh, not started yet, see us earlier, then you know, we can get the echo done, get some workup done, make sure that there's nothing. So the, the reason is because the echo is quite important. If, it's, if the EF is poor, then we might need to you know, do a cast, make sure there's no CAD, and uh, then, then go on from there. Yeah. Okay, so the patient didn't get an echo in patient, we should ideally get an echo before the PCU, and then if anticoagulation started, at least yeah. FBC uh, on arrival, just to make sure that the HB is stable. Yeah. Any other labs that will be yeah. relevant for you? Uh, so we, the, the other labs that we, we usually do is uh, renal function for so patients on DOEC. Mm. Okay. So you need to make sure that 
it's basically for dosing. Um, mm. But that doesn't need to be checked so soon. Uh, once a year or half a year, that should be fine. Patients on warfarin, you probably need to be a bit more careful. So INR, um, their liver function. But again, we don't routinely check their liver function. So mainly the INR. So that one, we need to go to ACC for, for INR, I mean for the warfarin titration. Okay. Yeah. Mm, okay, so next, uh, when are there patients that you consider ablation? So, the, I guess those. Mm. Uh, yeah, so the EP, EP procedures would be uh, mainly in patients who. So, the EP procedure that we do, there are two different types. Uh, first one is AF ablation, uh, in which basically we ablate around the pulmonary veins. So that's called PVI, pulmonary vein isolation. Basically, the reason is because uh, AF is usually triggered by uh, ectopic from the pulmonary vein, which then after that, you know, uh, triggers AF. So by, by ablating around the, the ostea of the pulmonary vein, you kind of um, prevent the, the ectopic bead from conducting into the atrium, okay? Uh, we tend to do that in patients who are very symptomatic or who are already on uh, anti arrhythmic therapy but are refractory to it. So meaning, they, they, they're just very symptomatic patients, okay, and, and usually in a proximal AF patients. So these are, these, these are the main group of patients that we do. Um, the, the recent trial, uh, CASTO AF, uh, actually showed that in patients with heart failure, uh, AF ablation actually should reduce mortality. Okay, so, um, but that said, I think a lot of us don't actually do it here, um, mainly because uh, patients are really quite unwell. I mean, those heart failure patients are quite unwell, so we don't do that. And in some patients, they might also need a device. Uh, so in heart failure patients, we put CRT as well, right? So patients already have a CRT. What we can then do is to update the AV node to ensure maximal uh, biventricular pacing. So whatever is on top is kind of dissociated from the bottom because they've already um, updated the AV node. Okay, so, so you just have continuous biventricular pacing. So, so that's the other uh, EP procedure that we might do for, for patients with heart failure who already have a CRT. Okay. Yeah. After they are PVI, do they still need to do anticoagulation? Uh, so for the first couple of months, I think first two months, okay. and then after you go by chest vest score. So, so the, the PVI shouldn't be done just so that you can uh, choose not to take anticoagulation. Okay. Yeah, it's mainly for symptom control. Yeah. Okay. So, so, but you still need to be able to take it for the first two, two or three months. Yeah. Okay, got it. Um, I think we sort of, okay, maybe just this bit, uh, you mentioned some of the labs already. Um, in general, for outpatient TCUs, uh, let's say I'm in Gen Med and I decide to TCU this AF patient myself, what are some of the things that I would need to look out for? Okay, so I would say number one, symptoms. Uh, uh, if the patient is getting more symptomatic, um, could be many things, uh, right? It could be the AF during exercise, or it could be the AF causing the heart uh, heart function to be poor. So AF can trigger heart failure. So your AF gets poorer and poorer and poorer. And these group of patients will need more workup. So like an echo and then you know subsequently go on to other investigations. That's one. Number two, uh, what we do is also need to look at the rate. So if the heart rate is persistently very high, 90, 100, 110 all the time, then you might want to increase the dosage of your beta blockers or digoxin or, or whatever the patient is on uh, for better rate control. Okay. Um, the third thing is also then you look out for whether the patient is on anticoagulation and the risk of bleeding. So any bleeding manifestation. The, 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 the thing with bleed with uh, anticoagulation is that some patients are chest vest one um, and they are 63 years old now. So in two years, you know that they're going to hit chest vest two, right? Mm -hmm. So these are the group of patients that you might want to keep at the back of your mind. Like, remind yourself that in two years, you know, this guy probably has to do anticoagulation. You need to start discussing with him early to prep him that he might need anticoagulation at some point. Uh, so these are the, the main things. Uh. So the, the symptoms, the heart rate, and, uh, and if the patient of anticoagulation. Okay. Um, so maybe this is more of an interesting question. Uh, I guess number one is, um, so, we put, so we put patients on varying degrees of monitoring based on indications. So, so some of your stroke patients, or you know, like get, may get telemetry monitoring, some of them get slightly more prolonged monitoring. So I guess the first question is, um, how long do you need to monitor to pick up AF? 
And I guess second is like in view of like, you know, like more wearables, Apple devices, are you seeing patients coming in with AF um, and do you use like such devices to your advantage in terms of let's say monitoring heart rate? Because you mentioned like heart rate is one of the important indicators in the management of AF. So why thoughts on this? Yeah, so so with um with proximal AF, uh, in terms of the in investigation part of it, uh, um, HOTUS plus minus because you only wait for twenty four hours at most for it, you might not pick it up if you don't have any AF uh, that day or you're not symptomatic. Right. So the, the longer the duration of monitoring, the higher the pickup rate. Okay. So if you look at uh, the loop recorders, uh, um, as you go on from from one year to three years, there's actually a very big jump from 13 to 30 percent, almost a double, uh, a doubling of the diagnostic rate. Um, and te technically, we use it more in the stroke patients. So, uh, if you have you know ESERS, right? Um, stroke of unknown significance. Yeah. So, so in that group of patients, it's actually quite useful because you've worked up everything. You can't find uh, any any cause. Uh, there's no AF in. On the inpatient telemetry, what you need is actually prolonged monitoring to look out for that, that PAF. Um, so that's where the loop recorder will come in. In patients who are very symptomatic very easily, uh, things like Apple Watches would be very helpful uh, because you know whenever you have a symptom, you look at your Apple Watch and it tell you where, what your heart rhythm is, what your heart rate is. Mm. Okay, so I think there was a study done overseas and actually showed that the Apple Watches do help in terms of picking up the AF. Uh, in terms of what you said, the heart rate also will be helpful. So all those daily heart rate monitors that you have for patients who already have AF, I mean, definitely helpful in terms of monitoring uh, what the average heart rate or daily heart rate is. Okay. So, so uh, I would say that there are different devices out there. Um, all for different, it depends on the patient characteristic and, and then after that, selecting which kind of uh, device you want to use. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Okay, so maybe like uh, you can, as we are wrapping up, are there um, commonly observed like mistakes made by the say junior doctors in AF management and what are some of the pitfalls that we just have to be careful about based on um, your experience? Okay, so I would say that, um, I, wouldn't say not, I, I wouldn't say so much that it's a mistake. Uh. I would say that um, sometimes as juniors, you're a bit more, more uh, particular about certain things, right? Like the heart rate, the number, and all that. So a lot of times what we do is we end up treating a number, right? You look at the heart rate of 120, you feel very uncomfortable, you want to bring it down as much as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, but you need to look at the overall uh, picture of the patient, the clinical picture, and go clinically, right? So if the patient has a heart rate of 120, you need to ask yourself why is heart rate 120? Mm -hmm. right? Is it um, because of something else? Is the patient decompensating? That's why his heart rate is going up. Uh, you know, so you, you know you have the drug, uh, the heart rate chart, right? The the monitoring chart. So if it's on sixty, you shoot up to one twenty suddenly. Something not right. So you go and find out the cause, mm -hmm. and not just give a beta blocker to block it and make it come down to something to a nicer number that you can accept. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think that's one. Number two, uh, like what we said earlier at the start, making sure that uh, that the diagnosis is EF is correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I have a ref I had a referral in clinic before to initiate anticoagulation from. Uh, I think I can't remember who it was, but basically for a patient um, to with AF, right? So this patient was from a private GP clinic, and mm -hmm. I didn't have the ECG with me. Okay. So I had to basically what I did was before starting the patient decoagulation, I asked the GP clinic to fax the ECG over, right? And the ECG actually did show AF, showed a lot of topics, like track topics. So mm -hmm. so it's very important that you you. Make sure that the diagnosis is truly AF before you commit someone to anticoagulation. Because if the patient does bleed from it, it's quite can be quite bad. Okay. Uh, so these are the two main things I would say. Uh, the third thing is in terms of anticoagulation, it must be very clear in terms of your explanation uh, to the family and to the patient of the bleeding risk. Mm -hmm. Okay, because you might think that it's a small thing. Giving claxin to you might be nothing. Right? We give everybody, right? But if the patient gets a bleed in the brain, it's actually a very big thing for the patient. So a lot of times we just give anticoagulation without uh, actually you know going too much into detail to the with the family. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing that you need to be very careful of because if you give tonight and so happens that he bleeds tomorrow morning or in the or tonight when he's sleeping, mm -hmm. then it's on you like, because you're the one who gives the, 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 the anticoagulation without telling anybody. Like. So the family's not aware of the risk. So so just to be very careful of that. 
how do you console in terms of leading risk? Do you give numbers? Do you, how do you frame the perspective of that? Yeah. So you need to tell them that number one, all, all anticoagulation uh, therapies have the risk of bleeding, uh, but it's all individualized, right? So that's why you have a head death score to help you calculate. So that will give the family a rough idea of how high or how low the bleeding risk is. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then you also have to tell them what kind of bleeding that can happen. So small ones like bruising, uh, usually, you know, it's just aesthetic, right? it doesn't make much difference. Uh, but the, 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 the more major ones like uh, intracranial hemorrhage or, or BG, uh, the ones that can be potentially fatal, they need to be aware of. Because uh, if you give someone anticoagulation and really does have ICH, then it's a big problem. Okay. So, so you need to actually be very clear to the family what kind of bleeding can occur and not just give a very generic term that, oh, um, anticoagulation can cause bleeding, but they, they don't know what kind of bleeding it can cause. So, so they have to be very careful with that. Okay. Okay, so now to um, the final question. I'm not sure whether there's anything you want to say about this, but uh, I guess as part of the um, educational aspect of things, uh, are there any key landmark trials that um, residents uh, should be familiar with and should read around in terms of just beefing up their knowledge about atrial fibrillation? Yeah, so I'll, I'll say that uh, the more important ones, that are probably more relevant would be the, the WAC trials. Mm. Like for your epic saban, uh, with rock saban, and the bigger trend. Mm. Okay, so these are trials that compare uh, patients with warfarin. So very important because you'll be prescribing a lot of all these drugs next time, um, and you kind of need to know the difference in terms of uh, the different drugs and how they differ compared to warfarin. Um, and then weight versus rhythm. I think you said just now a firm trial, mm. right? Uh, so that would be useful to know because then you kind of know when or when you should or should not start. Uh, anti Yeah. Okay. The 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 ones uh that are more uh that, I mean in more recent times a bit more popular would be the ablation trials. I'm not sure how much, uh, but it's quite sort specialized mm. So I'm not sure how much you need to know about that. But the basically there's the Castle AF trial and the Cabana trial. Mm. Uh, they're all AF ablation trials, but in different populations. So they actually showed different results. Okay. Um, it would be good to know. Good to know. So um. So that in case if anyone asks you what some things you can do, then these are the main things. Yeah. Okay, that's very helpful. Um, Nick, any last questions that you have uh, about AF? Okay, I think okay, never mind. Nick's zoom a bit laggy. Okay, I think uh, we've probably think come, yeah. yeah, we've come to the end of the question. So uh, thanks a lot, Doctor Eugene. I think it's very helpful. Uh, I think that's it. Come again. Okay, never mind. Okay. Anyway, thanks a lot. Uh then um yeah, thanks for your time and I think it's been very helpful. Uh. So okay, all things Thank you. Okay, thanks. thanks.